And welcome back to our conference today on race and philosophy. Um, our next speakers, next two speakers will be presenting on the topic of racism. And first we will have Alberto Urquidez from Bowdoin College. Dr. Urquidez is a postdoctoral fellow at Bowdoin College. He earned his PhD in philosophy from Purdue University. He works on issues of racism and language. He is the author of numerous articles, including a revisionist theory of racism, rejecting the presumption of conservatism, what accounts of racism do, and Jorge Garcia and the ordinary use of racist be belief. He's also the author of Redefining Racism, a Philosophical Analysis. And after his presentation, we will hear from Dr. Rima Basu, um, who is an assistant professor of philosophy at Claremont McKenna College. She earned her PhD in philosophy from the University of Southern California. She has published on topics at the intersection of epistemology, ethics, and the philosophy of race. Motivated by cases like that of the seemingly rational racist, the central theme of Basu's work is that when it comes to what we should believe, it's not a matter of the evidence alone. Moral considerations have a say as well. Her works include the wrongs of racist beliefs, what we epistemically owe to each other, and radical moral encroachment, the moral stakes of racist beliefs. So we're Thrilled to have both of them with us today, and we'll start with Dr. Arquidez. So I'd just like to begin by thanking uh, Corey Barnes for the invitation and uh, for the Humanity Center for sponsoring this uh, two-day conference. All right, so the title of my talk is, it talk is the, Pol the Political Dynamics of Inflated Definitions of Racism. So this is a continuation of my work on racism. So I have a recently published book, uh, Redefining Racism, where I take on uh, meta the metaphysical paradigm of uh, defining racism. And so what I'm doing now in my work is turning to pragmatic theories of racism. And so Lawrence Blum is the target of my critique, and I know he's presenting later, so this might make for an interesting discussion if he so happens to be listening and decides to weigh in. All right, so there's three sections to my paper, and I'm just going to jump right in because I'm, I think, at about 30 minutes with my presentation. So it's uh, the first section is conceptual inflation. So in his book, I'm Not a Racist, But Lawrence Blum argues that the terms racism and racist are overused in contemporary racial discourse. He offers various examples to illustrate, quote, some feel that the word racist is thrown around so much that anything involving race that someone does not like is liable to castigation as racist. Is television a racist institution? Asked an article concerning the NAACP's criticism of primetime networks, network shows for having no minority actors in lead roles. A local newspaper called certain blacks racist for criticizing other blacks who supported a white over a black candidate for mayor. A white girl in Virginia said that it was racist for an African American teacher in her school to wear African attire. The Milton Wisconsin school board voted to retire its Redmond name and logo depicting a Native American wearing a headdress because they had been criticized as racist. Merely mentioning someone's race or racial designation using the word oriental for Asians without recognizing its origin and its capacity for insult or socializing only with members of one's own racial group are called racist. Blum argues overuse of the terms racism and racist has led to the concept of racism becoming inflated. An inflated concept is a wide scope concept that takes the original meaning or extension of a term and expands it considerably. Blum worries that today, virtually anything and everything that is perceived to go wrong in the racial domain can be construed as racist. He further claims that the inflatedness of the concept of racism generates practical problems including inhibited interracial dialogue. People are hesitant to talk to one another about race because they fear being called racist. And since virtually everything these days can be castigated as racist, the overuse of the terms racism and racist discourages racial dialogue. The examples of overuse cited above illustrate the scope of conceptual inflation. However, they are not necessarily examples of the most consequential forms of inflation. A more interesting case is suggested by the term institutional racism, which was coined by the scholar activist Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton in 1967. Famously, they define institutional racism as any race neutral practice that perpetuates racial inequality. A classic example is word of mouth recruiting and employment hiring. For Carmichael and Hamilton, this norm in hiring inflicts as much harm, if not more, than intentional discrimination. Consequently, they argue, word of mouth recruiting is racist regardless of the intent of the individual recruiter. 
Blum agrees with the judgment that this discriminatory practice is wrong and argues that we should criticize it as racially unjust. However, he insists we should not criticize it as racist because this contributes to the inflation of racism. Among other things, the definition of institutional racism widens the concept of racism in a contentious way that is likely to foster disagreement. First, Carmichael and Hamilton's wide conception contributes to the tendency to conceive of racism as whatever produces race-based harm. This, however, threatens to dissolve any meaningful distinction between racial wrong and racism, which in turn discourages the use of other moral vocabulary in the racial domain. More important, a wide scope wide scope conception of racism, such as the harm-based definition of Carmichael and Hamilton, is likely to inhibit interracial dialogue. To put it bluntly, it is bound to scare away white people uh, from sustained dialogue with non-whites on racial matters for fear that they will eventually slip up and say the wrong thing, becoming ensnared in the trap of racism. Blum finds this problematic for whites and for non-whites, since both groups have an interest in entering into mutually respectful dialogue. Finally, Carmichael and Hamilton's wide scope conception of institutional racism is likely to cause resentment among those, especially whites, who strongly feel that unless they intend bad results, they're not culpable of wrongdoing. Race neutral policies that disproportionately harm members of a race tend to be condemned as racist when they affect people of color, but not when they affect white people. The rationale behind this stipulation is the goal of correcting past racism, but the upshot is that whites can never be victims of institutional racism, and some whites are likely to be resentful of this implication. To resolve the aforementioned problems of contestation and inhibited interracial dialogue, Blum proposes adopting a new definition of racism, one that eliminates much of the inflatedness of the term. His proposed definition is that racism be limited to cases where institutions are contaminated by what he calls racial inferiorization or racial antipathy. If we accept Blum's proposal, then institutional practices count as racist only when their design or operation is a function of either of these. For example, Blum would say that institutional racism exists in a case where a social worker's belief that a certain race is inferior leads her to deliberately ignore protocol or policy in evaluating an applicant's application for benefits. He would say that institutional racism exists in a case where a police officer's hatred for a certain race leads her to selectively apply a rule, such as pulling over a driver for a broken taillight, disproportionately to members of that race. In situations like these, argues Blum, racism in the individual contaminates the institution rendering it racist. A consequence of Blum's position is that many cases of institutional racial harm will not count as racist, for many such cases are neither intentionally harmful nor based on inferiorizing beliefs. However, the net benefit of rehabilitating interracial dialogue for Blum outweighs this limitation. What should we make of Blum's argument? Is the goal of achieving comedy in matters of interracial dialogue sufficiently valuable to do away with Carmichael and Hamilton's original analysis of institutional racism? Certainly they do not think so, for they introduced the concept to resolve a need that individualistic conceptions like Blum's do not meet. When they developed this conception, they del de deliberately set out to center harmful results slash impact over harmful intent slash belief. They argued that many acts perpetuate racial inequality independent of intent or belief because the inequalities that currently persist are products of the original sin of white supremacy. What primarily interested them was not individual con conduct and accountability, but institutional structures and norms. Hence, they favored a conception of racism that was critical of the role that norms, policies, and practices have in perpetuating injustice. In the remainder of this paper, I offer a critique of Blum's argument from conceptual inflation. I question Blum's normative contention that the ability for whites and non-whites to enter into respectful dialogue, say for purposes of negotiating resolutions to racial injustice, is so important and fundamental a value that it overrides the political value of conceptualizing institutional racism as Carmichael and Hamilton conceive it. For Blum, the cost of continued use of inflated definitions of racism is continued deterioration of racial dialogue, which is too high a price tag for him. However, I raise doubts about two of Blum's premises. First, that all inflated definitions of racism are undesirable. And second, that a proper resolution to the inflatedness of racism is a deflated individualistic definition. The upshot of my critique is that conceptual inflation considerations are not sufficient by themselves to undermine Carmichael and Hamilton's wide scope conception of institutional racism, or more generally, uh, wide scope conceptions from a racial injustice perspective. All right, section two, conceptual inflation and the sociology of race. In this section, I draw on the sociological analysis of Ashley Woody Doan to argue that the conceptual inflation of racism is a function of competing political interests. 
The implications of this analysis for Blum's argument will be discussed in section three, explaining conceptual inflation. In his paper, What is Racism? Doan describes the way in which the civil rights movement that began in the late 1940s and reached its peak in the 1960s successfully changed the standards of acceptable racial discourse in the United States. Because of the efforts of this influential counter movement to white supremacy, the standard of racial discourse today is the ideal of racial equality. This standard means that explicit appeals to notions of innate or biological racial inferiority and superiority are widely criticized as racist in virtue of transgressing the ideal of racial equality. That racial equality has become the de facto standard of racial discourse is evident in shifts in white attitudes on matters of race. Of course, racial equality in discourse did not translate into racial equality in social standing. Rampant racial inequality still persists. However, whites that defend racial inequality no longer primarily rely on arguments of white superiority and non-white inferiority. Not surprisingly, then, the ideology, ideology that protects white gains, advantages, and privileges that can be traced back to the United States white supremacist history has been forced to evolve to conform to the ideal of racial equality. As a result, the arguments given today are generally rooted in colorblind explanations. Doan describes the following discursive frames, as he calls them, or the ideological toolkit of colorblindness used to defend unjust white advantage. So the first element of this toolkit is abstract liberalism, which is a set of argumentative frames that attack race-based remedies seeking to mitigate the ongoing harms of present and past racism on grounds that they violate democratic principles such as equality or freedom. The second element in the toolkit is deriding multiculturalism. That is the use of uh, derisive terms like identity politics, tribalism, or political correctness to criticize multicultural events, cultural awareness and recognition initiatives and diversity, equity and inclusivity initiatives. Third, denials or minimizations of the persistence of racism, such as the judgment that racism is a thing of the past. The judgment that some obvious case of racism is an exception or an isolated incident or the charge that some allegation of racism is an over-exaggeration. Finally, impugning the motives, moral perceptions, or moral sensibilities of those who explicitly call out racism. For example, accusing the critics of racism of seeing racism everywhere and in everything, or of being oversensitive to racial jokes or microaggressions, or of playing the race card, that is, shifting the blame onto whites as a way of making excuses for one's own moral failings or the failings of one's own racial group. Doan's analysis can be expanded, expanded into an explanation of conceptual inflation. Whites have an interest in rejecting efforts to correct past racism. Hence, they have an interest in criticizing race conscious arguments and policies. And one way to do this is to endorse a definition of racism as race consciousness. By contrast, non-whites have an interest in advocacy on behalf of reparative race conscious policies. Hence, they have an interest in criticizing attempts to undermine such efforts. And one way to do this is to endorse a definition of racism as racial injustice. In other words, the conceptual inflation of racism may be a function of two competing political realities. While non-whites are increasingly vested in identifying racism with racial injustice, whites are increasingly vested in identifying racism with colored consciousness. The politics of claims making. In his paper, What is Racism? Doan dis Doan's discussion of the politics of contested definitions of racism occurs within the context of claims making. Claims making is concept formation that occurs by means of ostensibly descriptive judgments about social reality. The sorts of claims of interest to Doan are claims about what is and what is not racist. For instance, judgments like he's a racist or the criminal justice system is racist. Claims making needs an audience as the aim of claims making is to persuade. Hence, it is a phenomenon that typically occurs in the public domain, such as arguments that occur in print or social media, for example, op-eds or blogs. Second, claims making in the racial domain serves a political function. I will briefly describe the sense in which representations of racism are political. The political nature of claims making can be understood by reference to the idea of a speech act, that is performing a distinct act in the act of uttering a word. For instance, when a judgment in a courtroom finds a defendant guilty, or sorry, when, the, when a judge in a courtroom finds a defendant guilty, the judge does not merely perform the act of uttering a set of words. She also performs the act of finding someone legally culpable. Similarly, by calling something racist, an individual performs two speech acts in addition to the uttering of words. First, one performs the act of criticizing something as racist. Second, in criticizing something as racist, one performs the act of advancing a conception of racism, that is, one seeks to influence the audience's understanding of the meaning of the term racism. 
This latter act is the relevant political component. To illustrate, consider an example provided by Doan, quote, in a syndicated article published in the Hartford Current entitled Ingrained American Racism Killed My Son, Camille Cosby presents an interpretation of the well-publicized murder of her son, Ennis Cosby, by a young immigrant. According to Cosby, the murderer did not learn to hate black people in his native country, the Ukraine, but instead was influenced by the racism and prejudice that are omnipresent and eternalized in America's institutions, media, and myriad entities. For Cosby, racism is clearly more than a matter of individual hatred, as she cites a number of examples of institutional and cultural racism, ranging from health studies to the media to voting rights." End quote. By contrasting racism as racial hatred with the omnipresent racism baked into America's institutions, Camille Cosby does not merely criticize America's racist, but advances a definition of racism as systemic or structural. Cosby makes this assertion with full awareness that the concept of racism is contested, for she explicitly contrasts her own view of racism with the racial hatred definition. More importantly, Cosby is engaging the debate about racism by framing the death of her own son in accordance with her definition, that is, in a way that supports her view of what racism is. In this way, claims making about what is racist is partly meant to shape the reader's understanding about what racism itself is. The idea is that through the act of talking about racist phenomena, one offers a representation of reality while simultaneously shaping the nature of that very reality. Her interlocutors who published responses to Cosby in the Hartford Current were also engaged in the politics of claims making. They invoked the definition of racism as racial hatred to criticize Cosby's article. One respondent called her article racist and accused her of taking out, quote, her hatred on the founding fathers and great heroes of our country, end quote, for Cosby had discussed the slave owning status of several major historical figures. Another respondent described Cosby's article as blatantly racist for, quote, saying that the whole country is racist, end quote, and suggested that she, quote, get over her hate and meet all the Americans who treat others equally regardless of their race, end quote. This led to a, a second series of responses, but these examples are sufficient to illustrate the political nature and concept formation function of claims making and racial discourse. Because claims making is essentially about constructing and not merely describing social reality, there is more at stake in disputes about what is racist than meets the eye. Representations of racist phenomena are offered with the hope that their underlying conception of racism will endure or take hold. What is at stake in racial representation is not merely the truth of the particular representation, but the nature of racial representation as such. Section three, politicizing Blum's examples. In this section, I analyze a couple of uh, Blum's examples to argue that political considerations are frequently at work in cases of inflation. This analysis will lay the groundwork for my contention that the conclusions Blum draws from the phenomenon of conceptual inflation are unwarranted because his arguments do not engage the political dynamics of inflation. With that, I focus on the following two examples, mentioning a person's race and an African-American teachers wearing African attire. Example one, mentioning a person's race is racist. Let us begin with the example of characterizing as racist, merely mentioning a person's race. In response to the question, who do you mean? One might reply, the black man over there. If someone says it is racist to refer to uh, people by mentioning their race, is there any reason to think there is a political motive at work here? Arguably there is. The first thing we must consider is the following question. What is it about the assertion he's the black man standing over there that many people increasingly find offensive, even racist? Perhaps what is offensive is that pointing out a person's race forces other people to see race, that is acknowledge racial difference. One might find this problematic if one thinks that acknowledging racial difference is the source of social division and fraught racial relations. Thus, by calling race designations and descriptions racist, one implicitly challenges the distinction between a racial description and racist description. Since this remains a commonly accepted distinction in public context, a public display of offense at another person's racial description amounts to an implicit critique of that individual's racial awareness. By extension, it amounts to an implicit critique of most standard definitions of racism, which take the distinction between the racial and the racist for granted. Doan, interestingly enough, brings up a similar example. He considers an op-ed column written by a local radio host. In this op-ed, the author appeals to the value of color blindness, arguing that the constant focus on racial difference is the main source of racial bigotry in the United States. The op-ed contributor argues that US society has become so obsessed with racial discourse that racial consciousness has affected 
every aspect of society, the obsession with race for this contributor is institutionally present in various places, including the Census Bureau, schools, segregated dorms, social clubs, bilingual programs, and employers who are required by law to count color. For this contributor, racial categorization is so pernicious that the harm committed by overemphasizing racial difference is now far worse than the harm of racial discrimination. Consequently, racial categories should be abandoned. Examples such as this, argues Doan, suggest an emerging definition of racism, namely, quote, racism as race consciousness or the use of racial categories, a conception that represents the ultimate application of colorblind racial ideology and the claim that race doesn't matter, end quote. To illustrate the prevalence of this emerging conception, Doan provides an ironic example of its political invocation by, of all people, a civil rights leader, Ward Connerly, who introduced the California State Initiative seeking to ban the public use of racial uh, categories. Connerly's argument was that, quote, every time a country has adopted these device of race classifications, they have only served to suppress the group out of, out of favor. It is time California learned this history lesson and become truly colorblind, end quote. Doan argues that a full-on assault on racial justice is on the cusp as white resistance to racial categories makes it virtually impossible to track or measure racial injustice. Quote, banning and non-compliance with racial data collection is becoming increasingly widespread. This has significant political implications. If the collection of racial data is eliminated, then it will become difficult, if not impossible, to provide credible evidence of patterns of discrimination or even to assess the relative degree of racial inequality. Without such evidence, white advantages will become unassailable, a position made possible by a discourse employing the language of color blindness and anti-bigotry, end quote. Doan's analysis is supported by former President Donald Trump's executive order on combating race and sex stereotyping, which reads in part, quote, today, however, many people are pushing a different vision of America that is grounded in hierarchies based on collective social and political identities rather than in the inherent and equal dignity of every person as an individual. This ideology is rooted in the pernicious and false belief that America is, is an irredeemably racist and sexist country, that some people simply on account of their race or sex are oppressors, and that racial and sexual identities are more important than our common, common status as human beings and Americans." End quote. For the executive branch of the US federal government, at least under Trump, colorblindness is the official policy of the land. A statement of this form should not be dismissed as empty rhetoric for it threatened to restrict federal tax dollars to diversity and anti-bias trainings that involve quote unquote racist stereotyping as defined by the Trump administration. These cases place in plain view the overt political nature of the color conscious conception of racism. Its ultimate aim is to sound the death knell for racial justice. Those who have an interest in promoting racial justice thus have a reason to reject the view that anti-racism consists in color blindness. Blum, for his part, is critical of the color conscious conception of racism for the same reason he rejects the racial injustice view of racism. He claims that in both cases, the conception in question is inflated and thus contributes to inhibiting interracial dialogue. That said, Blum does not discuss the political implications of his own individualistic definition of racism. More importantly, by focusing ex exclusively on rehabilitating interracial dialogue, he fails to consider why people tend to be attracted to inflated definitions of racism in the first place. Inflated definitions or wide scope conceptions are attractive to many people precisely because of their wide scope. That is, they have the capacity to condemn a wide range of things as racist. For instance, the race conscious view of racism is useful for criticizing anything and everything that has to do with race, making racial jokes, referring to people by reference to their race, learning about race in the classroom, and so on. Similarly, the racial injustice view of racism criticizes every type of racial injustice afflicting non-whites regardless of the intention or beliefs of the agents involved. The politicized nature of definitions of racism means that adequately defending one of these definitions over the other cannot be resolved by reference to the need to deflate the concept alone. Oops, I lost my place here. As Blum argues, for the need as Blum conceives it is contested by those who think there is a need for an inflated concept of racism. What is required then are normative or pragmatic arguments for rejecting one or both of these conceptions and these will have to speak to the various interests at stake in the battle over who gets to control the grammar of racism. These reasons must be political in nature, otherwise the philosopher's message will fall on deaf ears and his argument will be de detached from the political considerations that, that, that prompt disagreement about racism. <clears throat> 
So the second example, wearing African attire is racist. Next, let us consider Blum's example of a white student that condemns as racist an African-American teacher for wearing traditional African attire to class. This example might seem detached from politics for non-political explanations are readily available. For instance, it might be argued that the student's racist description is based on cultural discomfort or xenophobia, perhaps a desire to live in a homogenous society. The student sees a teacher who looks different from her and she feels uncomfortable. Moreover, it might be argued that the ethnocentric desire to privilege one's own culture as normative is a phenomenon that applies to all groups, not merely to whites harboring racial anxiety. The objector is correct that ethnocentrism may be a cross-cultural problem, something that may plague all human beings. Nevertheless, Blum's example may not be politically innocent. Perhaps the premise behind the student's assertion that wearing African attire is racist is that African attire is racial attire. Thus, to wear it is to racialize one's body in a public way that provokes others to perceive it. In other words, seeing racial difference is morally objectionable or racist because society ought to be colorblind. Is it possible that the student in Blum's example is thinking along these lines? This might seem a bit of a stretch to some. However, this presumption is precisely what we should expect given the dominance of white norms and values. A young student does not have to have this conception of racism clearly worked out in her own mind for it to be implicit in the logic of her thinking. As Doan explains in his introductory chapter on an anthology on whiteness studies, quote, the central component of the sociology of whiteness is the observation that white Americans have a lower degree of self-awareness about race and their own racial identity than members of, of other racial slash ethnic groups. While the nature of white racial identity remains for the most part uncharted territory for sociological research, a growing body of research suggests that whiteness is a hidden identity. That is, that it does not generally intrude upon the everyday experience of most whites. In interviews with white subjects, Robert Terry, Joe Fegan, and Hernan Vera, and Beverly Tatum found that the most common answer to questions concerning the meaning of whiteness was, I never thought of it. Similarly, Judith Mar Martin and colleagues found that college students who adopted the white label were generally unable to provide any meaning for the identity beyond white means white, end quote. The invisibility of whiteness is a mark of the fact that whiteness is normative within society. Its invisibility is essential to the logic of colorblind thinking and rhetoric. To see this more, more clearly, notice what the individual in Blum's example assumes. That which is not white is racial. Presumably, this individual does not decry wearing quote unquote white attire as racist. There's no such thing as being racist in virtue of dressing white, except perhaps as a feeble joke. To dress white according to this individual is to dress normal, which is how things should be. For the individual in Blum's example, only non-whites can be properly categorized as racist or as racial. Whites do not constitute a race. Further, anything that is not white is problematic, less desirable, defective, threatening, or cause for anxiety. As Doan puts it, quote, to the extent that white racial unconsciousness persists, whites are less likely to perceive the degree to which whiteness permeates cultural understandings and institutional practices, and are thereby more likely to resist attempts to redefine the white center of American society, end quote. In short, the underlying politics of this argument is a politics of whiteness a politics that seeks to preserve whiteness as the norm. A colorblind world in this sense is a world that is all white. Concluding remarks. I have argued that many of Blum's examples are or easily could become cases of political disagreement. That is, political motives can and may well be informing specific judgments about what is racist and what is not racist. And the function moreover is not merely to shape judgments about what is racist, but about what racism itself is. The competing conceptions we have considered, racism as racial injustice and racism as race consciousness, are inflated conceptions. This is not an accident, for their inflated nature is what allows them to be used combatively against the opposing conception, as I have argued. To further emphasize this point, I introduced the, now the term parasitic contestation. A concept is parasitically contested if and only if some of its applications are deliberately invoked to criticize other applications of the concept. Racism is not merely a contested concept, it is a parasitically contested concept. The race consciousness and racial injustice conceptions of racism do not merely compete, they compete by criticizing one another as racist. If racism is race consciousness, then all attempts to repair existing racial injustice are racist, for all such attempts require seeing racial difference. If racism is racial injustice, then the conception of racism as race consciousness is racist, for the conception reduces all racial observations, including observations of racial injustice to racism. In short, the tendency toward inflation corresponds to the competing interests of both whites and non-whites. 
who play out their conceptions in the battlefield of parasitic contestation. Racial minorities seeking to appropriate the concept of racism for their own political gain have an interest in advancing a race conscious political agenda. Whites who belong to the racial majority arguably have an interest in opposing race conscious agendas that serve minority interests insofar as they negatively impact whites. The main conclusion here, so there's two conclusions. Uh, number one, Blum's analysis of conceptual inflation fails to distinguish politically legitimate and illegitimate forms of inflation within the prevailing political climate. He assumes that all forms of inflation are problematic, yet it is arguable that the inflated racial injustice conception of racism is indispensable in combating the white interest serving conception of racism as color consciousness. For many whites spontaneously draw upon the latter to criticize corrective racial justice measures. And then finally, Blum's pragmatic argument for an individualistic definition is ostensibly about promoting interracial dialogue. However, it is not at all clear that his individualistic solution would not undermine the political interest of non-whites. To be sure, Blum's individualistic definition of racism is not identical to the race consciousness definition, nor is it intended to curtail the racial justice interest of non-whites. Nevertheless, his analysis may well have this effect, for the phenomenon of parasitic contestation suggests that individualistic definitions of racism, such as Blum's, will be invoked combatively as much as possible to undermine racial justice advocacy. Furthermore, it is difficult to see how any definition of racism that is useful for purposes of advancing racial justice practice could be made consistent with Blum's requirement that a definition of racism be deflated. Blum's requirement that a deflated narrow scope definition is preferable to an inflated or wide scope definition may in the end curtail the construction of a conception of racism that is rich enough to promote the political interest of non-whites. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Dr. Basu who will present on seemingly rational racists and moral demands on belief. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, what I wanna do with the time that I have today is try to like lay out two conceptually distinct ways that I think morality might come to bear on belief uh, by looking at the case of what I'm gonna call the seemingly rational racist. And so you shouldn't have done it, but you did. Uh, against your better judgment, you scroll to the end of an article concerning the state of race relations in America, and now you're reading the comments. Amongst the slurs, the get rich schemes, the threats of physical violence, there's one particular comment that catches your eye. Spencer, that's just who, what I'm going to call him, Spencer argues that although it might be unpopular or politically incorrect to say this, the evidence supports believing that the black diner in his section will tip poorly. He insists that the facts don't lie, the facts aren't racist, and in denying his claim and believing otherwise, it's actually you who's engaging in wishful thinking, it's you who's believing against the evidence, it's you, not Spencer, that's epistemically irrational. And so my research project takes this challenge of like the rational racist as a starting point for considering how the norms governing belief must be revised to be responsive to the fact that we live in a society that's been shaped by racist attitudes and institutions. So in this slide, we just see like a classic image depicting redlining. Uh, but many philosophers have been kind of resistant to this idea that there are any moral epistemic norms governing belief. And what's commonly accepted is that the rationality of our beliefs is purely a function of the evidence. And so we have racist world on one hand and just follow the evidence on the other hand. Well, against this approach, I've argued that when it comes to determining whether we're justified in our beliefs, we also have to attend to the moral risks of those beliefs. So these aren't like two opposing things, but rather we can kind of find a way between them. And I think that unless we adopt this approach, it's difficult to articulate what the supposedly rational racist does that's wrong. Because given the effects of structural racism, his beliefs could have considerable evidential support. Nonetheless, his belief strikes us as like a paradigmatic example of a racist belief. But how could his belief be racist if it reflects reality and it's rationally justified? Moreover, how could he wrong anyone by believing what he epistemically ought to believe given the evidence? I mean, this is a challenge that someone like Spencer poses because it highlights this like tension between our deep interest in being responsible moral agents, those who form well-supported beliefs about the world, and in being responsible moral agents. Like living in an unjust world seems to put us in this sort of dilemma. And so to navigate and diagnose this tension, in my work, I've introduced two ideas. 
Uh, the first is doxastic rhyme, uh, which is the thesis that our beliefs, that is our doxastic states themselves, can be a source of wrongdoing, regardless of whether our beliefs are expressed in our actions. And second, moral encroachment, the thesis that moral considerations bear on the question of whether a belief is justified. And though conceptually distinct, these two sort of overlap in important ways. And when I've motivated both of them in my work, I've often motivated them with the same sort of cases, like the case of Spencer. And so what I want to do today is sort of lay out these two claims, the kinds of cases that motivate them, while also keeping in mind this character of the seemingly rational racist and what we should say in response to them and how we should diagnose what's going on in that case. So let's start with moral encroachment. So moral encroachment is the view that moral considerations bear on the justification of belief. Critics of moral encroachment claim that moral considerations do not bear in any way on justification. After all, beliefs aim at truth, um, but we often get things wrong. Uh, nonetheless, there are ways our beliefs can be better or worse, even when the truth of the matter eludes us by being justified or unjustified. And a traditional view of justification is evidentialism. According to evidentialism, what you should epistemically believe is a function of the evidence. Or the evidence can't guarantee truth, it's the kind of thing that's truth conducive. It raises the likelihood of truth. And so then that brings us to purism, this other thesis that stands in the way of moral encroachment. Because according to purism, what you should believe is a function of only purely epistemic considerations. I don't know why they're texting me right now. I told them not to, but there we go. All right, um, where was I? Uh, so what you should believe is function only of purely epistemic considerations, i.e. those things that are truth conducive and importantly, not moral nor practical. And so in contrast to this, uh, let's consider uh, moral encroachment. So in contrast to evidentialism, in contrast to purism, I'm gonna try to make the case for moral encroachment, that moral considerations bear in the justification of our beliefs. And so the common case that almost all accounts of moral encroachment centers on is a case about the Cosmos Club, where John Hope Franklin is mistaken for a staff member. So imagine a swanky DC social club. In the original case, the Cosmos Club, but to update it for our times, here's the dining room at Mar-a-Lago. So the social club has hiring and club membership practices that resulted in a stark racial divide between club members and staff members. That is only a fraction of the club members are black, whereas all of the club staff members are black. And so now imagine Agnes and Esther. This is the image I like to use. There are two particular women that I keep in mind when I'm imagining Agnes and Esther, but you have a, your pick amongst this picture. So Agnes and Esther are both members of the Swanky DC Social Club. This club is so fancy that it's like a strict dress code of tuxedos for both male guests and staff members and dresses for female guests and staff members. While preparing for their evening walk, the two women head to the coat check to collect their coats. As they approach the coat check, they both look around for a staff member. As Agnes looks around, she notices a well-dressed black man standing off to the side and tells Esther, there's a staff member, we can give our coat check ticket to him. Uh, give me one second, I'm trying to see if I can turn off notifications. I thought I had on my iPad, but maybe because I'm on my computer, it's also still showing up. So she says, there's a staff member we can give our coat check ticket to him. In this case, it seems that Agnes's belief is justified, but the person she mistakes for a staff member as taken from his biography, which is the source of this case, is John Hope Franklin. Now, Agnes has clearly done something wrong. Uh, but what she's done wrong on the face of it doesn't seem like an epistemic mistake because given the racial makeup of the club that the man standing in the lobby is black provides substantial evidential support for the belief that he's a staff member. I need to really press this point with some numbers. Let's say it's like a busy night at the club with approximately 500 guests. Uh, of those uh, of those guests, only five are black, whereas all 50 staff members are black. Well, with those numbers, the chance of a well-dressed black man being a club member is only 9%. The chance that he's a staff member is 91%. Now, in most cases, 91% certainly would be more than enough to justify believing. For example, if I told you there's an 80% chance of rain tomorrow, it wouldn't be irrational to believe that it'll rain tomorrow. If I asked you what you were planning to do tomorrow and you said you were planning to throw a barbecue, that'd be really odd. 
you'd be irrationally disregarding the evidence. There's a sense in which you'd be epistemically criticizable for disregarding the evidence. So if you're justified in believing that it'll rain tomorrow on the basis of an 80% chance of rain, wouldn't Agnes be like similarly justified or even more justified uh, on the basis of like 91% chance that the well-dressed black man is a staff member? Well, so to wrap up so discussion of this case, if we return to purism, this kind of demographic evidence in the Cosmos Club appears to be sufficient to justify forming the belief that John Hope Franklin is a staff member. Proponents of moral encroachment, on the other hand, have denied that we should draw this conclusion on the basis of demographic evidence alone. Rather, they claim that we must also take into consideration various moral features of the scenario. For example, we might take into consideration the moral implications of mistaking one of the few black club members for a staff member, which again, a paradigmatically racist thing to do. That isn't quite enough to establish moral encroachment to sort of get us to that intuition in a bit of a stronger way. I'm gonna provide another case, the argument from inductive risk. And so the general spirit of this argument claims that look, we're limited agents for whom uncertainty is inevitable. The risk of being wrong is ineliminable for the kind of limited creatures that we are. Given this risk, morality must enter into our epistemic deliberations regarding whether the risk is worth it. Uh, the historic precursor for this argument can be found in Richard Rudner in his paper, The Scientist Qua Scientist Makes Value Judgments. In that paper, he notes that our decision regarding the evidence and respecting how strong is strong enough is going to be a function of the importance in the typically ethical sense of making a mistake in accepting or rejecting the hypothesis. Runner gives the example of requiring a relatively high degree of confirmation or confidence with regard to the safety of a drug containing a lethal ingredient versus the not as high level of confirmation or confidence required for whether a machine stamping belt buckles is defective. And so the relevant difference between the two cases, of course, is the grave moral consequences of getting wrong the drug dosage and the relatively light moral consequences of getting wrong the defectiveness of the machine. Now, I don't believe there's only one kind of moral consideration that should go into the evaluation of inductive risk. Ultimately, the question of what moral considerations matter uh, will be settled by like first order moral theories. For example, let's say you held a first order moral theory that hypothesized that beliefs could wrong in various ways. Well, that would be one sort of consideration that would get in. And so that's the theory of doxastic wronging, which I'll turn to next. So according to doxastic wronging, well, turning to doxastic wronging, I wanna set aside these issues of justification to highlight another way that morality comes to bear on what we believe about one another. And so although it's right, like it is just right, beliefs aim at truth, truth is a condition for belief. They, beliefs aim at truth only in virtue of having intentional content that represents the world being a certain way. That content provides a perspectival mode of presentation that mediates a relation to the external environment. This mediation is central to like Frank Ramsey's idea that beliefs subserve the function of navigation. They're the map by which we steer. So not only do beliefs about the arrangement of space around us allow us to navigate the world, more generally so too do beliefs about people help us navigate our social world. It's in virtue of belief committing us to this content, content that represents, in the case of beliefs about another person, perspectival claims about that individual status in the world, that I conjecture solidifies belief's moral standing. By mediating our interpersonal relations to others, beliefs about others bear moral weight. And so doxastic wronging is a thesis that beliefs in virtue of the standing can sometimes themselves be the source of moral wrongdoing. And so to give an example, let's consider Grace uh, from the hit Netflix show, Grace and Frankie. During an interview in season five of the show, uh, Grace reveals some beliefs she holds about her daughters, Brianna and Mallory. She believes that Brianna has run the family company into the ground. She also believes that neither, neither that Mallory is a smart daughter nor that she's made good use of the degree, a degree that Grace paid for. Ultimately, like later as her daughters pack up their desks, Grace is confused by why her daughters are upset with her, but she's willing to apologize for having said what she did. But as Mallory points out, it's not that you said all those terrible things, 
It's that you actually believed them. And so here Mallory's making this overwhelmingly intuitive point that the source of wronging is not in what Grace said, but in what she believed about her daughters. And so I think this exchange demonstrates these three hallmarks of doxastic wronging, that doxastic wrongs are directed, that they're committed by beliefs rather than the consequences of acting on the belief, and that doxastic wrongs are wrongs in virtue of the content of what's believed. And so elaborating on these in reverse order, I again take it that beliefs having the representational content that they have is essential to the sort of moral standing. So that's all mark three. This content represents her daughters as standing in particular relation to the property she attributes them. For example, her, her belief about Brianna relates Brianna to attributes like being a bad CEO. And naturally her daughters have legitimate complaints about the picture that that content paints of them. And there are many features that factor into whether complaints and belief are legitimate, but for now I'm gonna take Brianna and Mallory's to be an uncontroversial case. But beliefs aren't just constituted by their representational content, they also place the bearers of those beliefs in a particular relation to the content, one of committing to those, that content being true. And so that's hallmark too. Because propositional attitudes involve both uh, propositions, representational contents, and attitudes, relations to the contents, and beliefs are committal mental states. They involve committing the subject to the truth of the representation. And so that's why beliefs can wrong. The representational content together with that commitment constitute a wrong in the belief itself. Like if Grace had just said the relevant propositions but wasn't committed to the content being true, like she thought lying would save the company, well, her daughters would feel differently. They might be upset that she lied. They might be suspicious of why she chose those particular lies, but those would be different complaints. Or if she like doubted, denied, or feared that, the way the content represented her daughters, then there'd be no complaint at all. It's the belief that the mother was committed to the particular content that she was that wronged her daughters. Now, although this case hasn't concerned racist beliefs, we can see how it would like easily extend to beliefs with racist content. Like I made a very conscious choice to focus on this kind of interpersonal case and with the case of Spencer to focus on the stereotype regarding tipping rather than the usual kinds of stereotypes they use, but you can sort of see how we can extend this analogy. But finally, with respect to this first hallmark, with respect to beliefs being directed at others, let me say a bit more about that by turning to uh, something that Ray Langton sort of notices. So Ray Langton makes this point that, look, we don't simply observe people as we might observe planets. We don't simply treat them as things to be sought out when they can be of use to us and avoid when they're a nuisance. We are, as Strawson says, involved. Like when it comes to people, there's a different way of going about. And this way of going about concerns not only how we treat them through our actions and our words, but also how we consider them in thought. And so like Barry Marusic and Stephen White have similarly argued that when it comes to persons, like the core Kantian idea that underpins the idea of the categorical imperative is the following, that our way of relating to people is categorically different from our way of relating to objects persons as ends in themselves are not to be related to in the way one relates to objects. And once you accept that general intuition, you might begin to wonder, all right, so how are we gonna capture this different way of like relating to others? Well, this being involved that Langton attributes to Strawson is the recognition that others' attitudes and intentions towards us are important in a way that's distinctive to the kinds of thing that we are. And that our treatment of others, like our beliefs about others should respect that kind of importance. We are each of us in virtue of being social beings vulnerable and we depend upon others for our self-esteem and self-respect. Respect and esteem aren't just mere matters of how we're treated in word and deed, but also a matter of how we're treated in thought. And so the implication of this quite minimal kind of Strawsian and Kantian picture that I'm painting here is that people should figure in, our, in both our theoretical and practical reasoning in a way that's different from objects. Because we care how we feature in the thoughts of other people. We want to be regarded in their thoughts in the right way. And so doxastic wrongs are failures to regard people in the right way. And so I've explained these two doctrines. I've explained sort of what the various commitments are, what the various cases are that motivate them. But you might sort of think, all right, well, I accept one, but I don't accept the other, or like I don't 
like there are various different ways of combining the views, which would take too long to sort of go into. But for now, I just want to explore like various ways that they can be separate to see if I can get you to bite the bullet on at least one of them. Uh, so by keeping the doctrine separate, we can also demonstrate how there are prominent views that accept one while rejecting the other. Uh, so here are some examples of some dominant views that, you know, uh, would accept moral encroachment, but not doxastic wronging. So that's like Rudner, doxastic wronging, but not moral encroachment. You get doxastic partiality views like Sarah Stroud and Simon Keller, or like believing against the evidence views like Barry Marusic. But I want to sort of wrap up so that we have enough time for like Q&A at the end, because I'm sure there are like plenty of questions that people have. So I'm going to skip over going into detail about the doxastic partiality views or going into details about Marusic's view. And what I want to point to is one worry that you might have that comes, well, one worry you might have when we have like morality. I wanted to make sure I stopped on this slide. This uh, worry we might have about morality and epistemology being sort of pit against each other as though they are at odds with each other. And so this worry is voiced by Jennifer Soule, who notes that accounts that pit morality and epistemic rationality against each other fit exceptionally well with right-wing narratives of politically correct thought police attempting to prevent people from facing up to difficult truths and of the over-emotional left, which really needs to be corrected by the sound common sense of the right. Anything that props up these narratives runs the risk of working against the cause of social justice. That is, it seems a bad consequence of a view if say opposition to racism, what's morally required, leads one into epistemic irrationality. And I think this worry can be mitigated by adopting moral encroachment, because I think what Sol's quote demands is a kind of coordination between the moral and the epistemic, which is what moral encroachment provides. Like it recognizes we're limited agents, we're trying to reason in a world that's been structured by racism. And so we're going to have to consider these practical and moral risks that are associated with how we respond the evidence. And so any theory of justification, any adequate theory of justification for the kinds of beings that we are, for the kind of world that we find ourselves in, has to be a theory of justification where justification is responsive to the moral stakes of our beliefs. And similarly, another reason not to be too worried about the conflict is, as Keller notes, the demands of human life are varied and conflicting, and the standards that apply to belief formation are varied and conflicting too. And so just to wrap up real quick, what have I done? Well, hopefully I've clarified this relationship between two doctrines in order to demonstrate two distinct ways that morality might come to bear on belief. The first concerning justification and the second concerning belief's role in our interpersonal relationships. And also what I hope to have made clear uh, is a case for how thoroughly morality permeates our lives, including aspects we initially thought were beyond its purview. And finally, it might be daunting to consider just how many demands morality makes on us, like now it's making demands on just how we think about other people, but a brief glimpse at the world su should suggest that maybe we're undercounting the wrongs that we're capable of. And whatever story we wanna tell about epistemic justification should be sensitive to the actual conditions under which we're trying to gather ev evidence and form beliefs about other people. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. Alberto, I would love if you sent me your paper. I So I teach a uh, um, uh, conceptual inflation paper that you're sort of critiquing in my philosophy of race class. And the students often have like quite similar critiques as the ones that you raise. And I think it would be like an excellent piece for them to like dig their teeth into. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll send that to you. It's not really a question about the content. <laughs> I was thinking that too, that it, it was so clearly well written, it would be like a good one to say, this is how you make an argument and this is how you make it really clear. I'm thinking about what you were saying that disastic, disastic wrongs are wrongs in virtue of the content of what is said, um, not what is said. That I think that was one of the theses that you put forward. Um, and so I, I think at some point you give an example, I can't remember exactly the example, um, someone said something X, I don't know what that thing was. You were pointing out that the wrongness did not derive from what was said, but from what was believed um, by the speaker. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, I, was, I was thinking about another kind of example that can come up. For example, it, it might be just different from yours and you have different ways of thinking about it. So 
consider an example, and this kind of example I'm getting ready to give, it comes from the lives of white children, the way they behave. I'm not making this up out of my head. It's rare that I have to make up things about that white people say. So consider an example where a little white girl says to a little black girl with her white friend standing around, you're a boy. Now, I'm going to assume here, and that's why I made the point about I'm not making this up. So the assumption is not a made up assumption that neither the speaker nor her friends believed what was said. They didn't believe that the girl was a boy. Their statement and intent to hurt and the belief that the statement would hurt comes from their knowledge of racist tropes and how black girls live in and with these tropes of being told that they're boys, thought to be boys, perceived to be boys. And I'm talking about cis black girls. Okay, but this, but you could be talking about a trans black girl, but I'm talking about cis black girls. Um, so in this particular case, it would seem that the wrongness does not have to do with the belief that the black girl is a boy, but what, 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 what was said. So I'm wondering if you distinguish these two kinds of cases, and if you do, what, what, what markers, maybe there's not some kind of a priori marker, I don't know, but what kind of markers would you use to distinguish this kind of case um, where the, con the, 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 the wrong the seems to come from what was said and not the belief, unless you want to take the belief all the way back to uh, something having to do with what they believe about what would hurt this person, but still what was said would seem to me to be very operative in this case. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna mute. Yeah, fantastic case. Uh, I, that's the kind of case that I don't think I would want to try to accommodate under doxastic wronging. Like that I think is more so a kind of case that can be captured under just what it is that we try to do with words and what various speech acts try to convey that don't need to be accompanied with beliefs. Like I think this, like I'm kind of just like spitballing here trying to figure out how I would best want to describe the case but that kind of case made me think of just how outlandish some of the like common like sexist and racist stereotypes are and how speech functions in a way to like just say things that no one would that gives you kind of plausible deniability about what you say it's like no one's saying she's like actually a boy so if you were to press them on that, that would often be like a way that they would try to respond. It made me think of, I forget her name, but like the Jewish space lasers lady. Uh, and it's like, if you were to press her on it, it's like, well, no one would actually believe that, but there's something you're doing with words. There's something you're doing with like putting that speech out, act out there that makes it easier to then like follow up with ways of treating that person in virtue of that speech act. I, there I think it's like words and language that's causing what's happening in that situation. I think it would be over intellectualizing in that case now say to try to trace that back to any particular beliefs that they have. And so one thing I do want to clarify is I'm not trying to give an account of like what goes wrong in every single case like this, but just I think doxastic wrongs are one area that hasn't really been theorized as much about, whereas I think the sort of languagey cases have often been more of the focus, but I don't have a like well worked out view of how to analyze that case, but my initial inclination is there's probably something with like what they're doing with words in that case that better explains that case than an account of doxastic wronging would. Okay, thanks. Um, our next question is from Grant Silva. I have two questions, one for each of you, but maybe I'll just ask one for the sake of time. And if we have more time, I'll ask the other one. It's to uh, Dr. Basu. Um, in terms of thinking about the, I want to ask you about the role of responsibility in, in the sense of wronging that you bring up here, especially in terms of the second doctrine that you offer. Because in many ways, our understanding of what constitutes um, a reasonable belief is conditioned by the culture and social atmosphere that we inhabit. And so I'm thinking about the ways in which um, media, you know, various social media news outlets condition our fears, they condition our awareness to certain fears rather than others, right? So we're led to believe that certain things are going, certain individuals are gonna be more problematic or more dangerous um, as opposed to others. And so uh, I always tell my students, you know, 
I leave my wallet out on the um, lectern in front of my classroom with the group of individuals who are most likely to perform identity theft, right? And yet I worry more about riding my bike in front of the um, museum where there happens to be a lot of racial minorities, right? Like I'm conditioned to think of certain fears more than others. And so I wanna sort of ask you about, you know, to what extent then are we to hold people accountable um, for this sense of wronging when it's always so easy to beg off on what was led to that kind of belief? It, it, you know, the, the sense of reasonableness here seems to come out of the social structure. I hope I'm making sense. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know how satisfying my aunts will be. And just my response is like, well, morality is extremely demanding. Uh, it's incredibly hard to be a good person. And so one of the things we have to fight is in fact that social conditioning is in fact that we are growing up in a world that's structured by like racist institutions. And so the deck is stacked against us if we want to believe well of other people and if we just wanna just straight up be good people. And so it's gonna be incredibly difficult, but I also don't think it's impossible like I do think it's possible to reflect on your beliefs and like change your beliefs and in turn change your behaviors. But maybe I should have stopped there because then the next thing I want to say is like, even if it were impossible, I still think morality would still have these demands on us. But that's like my own like idiosyncratic rejection of like all implies can, which we don't need to go into. It's real hard, but I think it's possible. Um, that's sort of where I would stand on that. I also found both these papers really exciting and interesting and thank you for the work that you've put into them. And I guess um, I wanted to say something just sort of a helpful, maybe helpful thing for uh, for your paper, Dr. Basu. I, I thought that um, I thought that your claim about the possibility of doxastic wrongs seems really compelling. And part of the reason it seems so compelling to me is that I think one way we tend to praise people we think highly of is to say that, or maybe this is a particularly like feminine coded virtue or something, but it's like uh, someone who tends to think well of others or to give other people the benefit of the doubt. We, we think of that as a moral virtue. Uh, we think of a person like that as someone who is doing good by the way that they think of others. And, and I, I feel like this is a way that people get praised at their at their death frequently, where we say like, oh, she was so wonderful. She always thought so well of everyone and gave everyone the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, and so I'm really persuaded that this is the kind of thing that we think of as a good making trait. And that means we must believe that people have some control over it, that we can in fact make these choices about how we see other people and that it's our responsibility to, um, to think well of others whenever we can. And that must mean trying to overcome our racist beliefs. So I just thought like, if that is in any way helpful in convincing other people that doxastic wrongs are actually happening, then I would want you to have that in your toolbox too. Yeah, thank you. So my, my question was about your claim. I really found your paper fascinating. The, um, the ways in which interest can in, in many ways dictate how we use and understand the term racism, right? And so you made the claim that um, from, from the perspective of whites, the term racism seems to really call to mind color consciousness, right? Whereas for non-whites, there's this rectificatory justice perspective. Um, it would seem like the discussion of racism then from the perspective of, of whites is mostly about promoting ideology, right? It's, this, it's the kind of understanding of racism that really wouldn't do anything in terms of rectifying inequality. It just is a kind of like, well, now we're gonna be honest about the fact that we see the world from a colored perspective or we see color. I don't know if maybe, you know, that's where you were going with that, but I, I wanna hear more about it. So I think you, I think you got my view right. Um, and feel free to turn on your camera too, if you want, <laughs> if I can incline you to do so. Um, but yeah, um, well, what exactly about, I think you got, I think you analyzed my view accurately. But uh, what, what did you want to hear more about exactly? It would, I, so I, I like the general upshot of the project, right? That how we think about mm -hmm. racism is in many ways motivated by our, our um, political concerns, right? Um, and I also like, you know, I've read your book when the Society for Mexican Americans in Philosophy are doing an author meets critic session on Saturday on Bethel's book. So if you want to join us at the APA Central, there's my, there's my plug. But um, <laughs> it seems to be that what you're saying here is that 
in in thinking about racism from the perspective of white people, it seems to be about promoting color consciousness, helping white people understand that they see um, that they that they think in racial terms, and that seems to really just do a bunch of ideological work, right? It's a conception of racism that makes no difference in terms of the world as it is in terms of racial inequality. And so I'm wondering if you know that's the direction you were going in that distinction there um, when, when you were making that distinction, because to me, it strikes me as right, but I just wanna hear more about what you, what you were saying. Yes, where, do, where are we going from here? So I, I think what, where I want to go anyway um, is I mean, perhaps in a different direction to, to say that, look, as philosophers, what we should be interested in is developing, uh, if, if we're concerned about racial justice, we should be interested in defending um, a racial injustice conception of racism, which is going to be an inflated conception. Um, and yeah, so it's a, I'm going towards the, the pragmatism, right? Giving a pragmatic argument for how we should think about racism. So I think Blum was on the right track in terms of, he's not concerned about the metaphysics of racism, right? He's bypassing all of that. And he's interested in uh, how should we be thinking about racism for moral practice? And I essentially agree with that, except I would want to say we should be thinking about it for political practice as well, right? Um, and that that should be the broader framework within which we think about racism. So we need to be combating the race conscious uh, view of racism, in my view. Uh, I think that's where we need to be going. Um, and yeah, so that's, I don't know if that answered your question exactly, but um, that's, yeah, that's where I think we're, we should be going. Thank you so much to both of our speakers and